The Federal Aviation Administration's Aviation Safety Program presents the Safer Skies Aviation Training Series. The Safer Skies agenda originated in 1998 when the administrator and her team identified the most critical and most common causes for aviation accidents. Aeronautical decision making, weather, loss of control, controlled flight into terrain, survivability, and runway incursions. Together, these six make up the majority of all general aviation accidents. We encourage all airmen to view all six presentations. The FAA's primary goal is reducing fatal accidents, and that's a responsibility we all share. Let's take the time to focus our attention on these six critical subjects. Hello, my name is Chuck Yeager. Now that's actually not true, but about half my lies aren't true. I'm really Ralph Hood and I'm an aviation humorist. But today I'm here to talk seriously about aviation safety and the FAA's initiative called Safer Skies. Today we're going to discuss loss of control. Loss of control refers to accidents resulting from situations in which the pilot should have maintained or regained aircraft control, but for some reason did not. Some loss of control accidents occur during mission-related activities such as aerial application, banner towing, aerobatics, law enforcement, pipeline patrol, photography, or medical evacuation flights but most occur during personal, not mission-related flying. Now, I think I'm pretty safe in saying that no pilot ever started out with the goal of losing control of the aircraft. But the accident reports are loaded with ugly statistics about, frankly, pilots who did do just that. The overall goal of the Safer Skies program is to reduce the number of fatal accidents in general aviation. Now, that's a pretty lofty goal when you consider that in a recent five-year period there were 9,087 general aviation accidents in an estimated 138 million flight hours. That's one accident for every 15,000 flight hours. 19% of these accidents were fatal, resulting in 2,976 deaths. An AOPA Air Safety Foundation study of general aviation accidents showed that pilot failure to maintain control of the aircraft was the leading factor for both takeoff accidents and landing accidents. And in almost every case, the loss of control stemmed from inadequate training or lack of pilot proficiency. In other words, human factors. Of course, there are times when mechanical problems bring down an airplane. And as we shall see, the way a pilot responds even to mechanical issues can make the difference between life and death. This takes us back to the root of all aviation safety issues, aeronautical decision making, or ADM. I think you'll quickly agree that basic ADM issues are at play throughout the entire process of planning and executing a flight. Proper aeronautical decision making helps ensure first that the pilot is not put in a position where loss of control is likely and second, that the pilot will be best able to regain control in any given circumstance. ADM is defined as a systematic approach to the mental process used by pilots to consistently determine the best course of action in response to a given set of circumstances. Another way to look at ADM is controlling the errors. Error management within the aeronautical decision-making process relies upon situation awareness, problem or threat recognition, and good judgment in resolving 
the threat or the error. A simple way to apply the decision-making process is the three P's, perceive, process, perform. Take in all the available information, figure out what to do with that information, and then do it. After the perform step, evaluate the outcome of your action, which starts the 3P process all over again. Perceive, process, perform. So let's get started on loss of control. We have two instructors today. The first is Mr. Ben Coleman, an inspector with the Federal Aviation Administration. Now Ben's in Florida at the Seminole Lake Glider Port. You there, Ben? Standing by, old buddy. Our other instructor is right here with me in Alabama. In fact, this is his place, Mr. Greg Coons. Great to have you here, Ralph. Good to be here, Greg. And Greg and his wife, Cora, own and operate Greg Coons Air Shows and Aerobatic School at Sky Country Lodge a beautiful bed and breakfast on a private grass strip in the hills of northern Alabama. Greg specializes in upset training and aerobatic training. These are courses designed for the GA pilot who wants to get a real handle on maneuvering flight. And we encourage all pilots to take a course like this if possible. In fact, I'm hoping for a little stick time myself later. Ralph, have you ever been upside down? It's, it's been a long time and a few pounds. <laughs> we'll get you up later. Right now, let's get a little background from Ben. Thanks for the setup, guys. Having been a National Transportation Safety Board investigator and currently an FAA inspector, I have personal experience with some of the accidents used for industry statistics. A great source of these statistics is the Joseph T. Nall report published by the AOPA Air Safety Foundation. About two-thirds of the GA accidents, almost half of the fatalities happened during the takeoff, maneuvering, and landing, times when the demand on the pilot are the greatest and when the pilot is most likely to lose control of the aircraft. Loss of control is consistently the most common type of fatal aviation accident and affects pilots of all levels of experience. 18% of takeoff accidents and just 2.5% of landing accidents were fatal. But listen to this. Someone died in over 57% of maneuvering accidents. In this program, we'll examine some of the most common situations where pilots lose control of the aircraft. But there is some good news. 2004 saw the fewest GA accidents since record keeping began in 1938 and the lowest number of fatal accidents since 1945. With continued diligence and advances in technology like the capstone program in Alaska, we hope to keep the trend going in the future. Let's start learning about loss of control with a few definitions. As Ralph said, loss of control simply refers to accidents resulting from situations in which the pilot should have maintained or regained aircraft control, but didn't. In other words, every loss of control accident, as we're using the term, involves human factors, the pilot making a mistake. The term maneuvering flight covers a lot of areas we'll be talking about. We all know what takeoffs and landings are, but maneuvering flight refers to any type of flying performed close to the ground and or involving steep turns and or aerobatics. It also includes most of the time you spend as a student pilot with your instructor, but simply flying in the traffic pattern is maneuvering flight as well. We must keep this in mind when we're considering the 16% of all fatal accidents occur during maneuvering flight and that most of these occurred during personal, not mission related flights. There's a pretty good and recent DVD produced by AOPA's Air Safety Foundation titled Maneuvering Flight, Hazardous to Your Health. That video is high on my list of recommendations. Details for how to order are at the end of this program. There are two solutions that will eliminate almost 100% of the loss control accidents. Good ADM and good airmanship. Airmanship 
may be defined as physical handling of the aircraft and the ability to put the machine just where you want it, when you want it to be there. While the Safer Sky series is not intended to teach pilots the technical skills of flying, we want in this program to offer some practical tips that will help you avoid the most common loss of control accidents. To do this, we'll have some help from a very special commercial flight instructor, Mr. Greg Koontz. Check this guy out. Out of control? It might look that way, but my routines are a series of precise control maneuvers. I might have a transitional moment between phases of control, but I always know where the airplane is going because I've always put it in that situation. As Ralph said, I teach what's called upset training. It's called upset training because it has to do with situations when the aircraft is put in an upset or unusual attitude. By definition, an upset is any unplanned, extreme attitude resulting from factors such as weight turbulence or wind shear. Many pilots have no interest in flying aerobatics, and that's just fine. But situations can arise during the course of normal flight where aerobatic skills can save the lives of you and your passengers. In aerobatics, more than any other type of flying, precise and quick control inputs might spell the difference between a successful flight and a total disaster. That doesn't make the endeavor dangerous in and of itself, but it does underline the fact that proper and positive control of the aircraft under all conditions is the key to success and safety. When you receive upset training, you'll come to know how an airplane handles in extreme flight situations, and perhaps most importantly, you'll learn what is not possible and what situations must be avoided completely. No training can ensure that you'll recover from an inadvertent spin in the traffic pattern. Even the most skilled pilot requires sufficient altitude, about a thousand feet, to recover from a spin. But by being trained and prepared first to avoid upset-inducing situations and second to know how to deal with them when you have to, we can go a long ways towards safer skies. In general, civilian trained pilots aren't well prepared for the sight picture, vestibular effects, panic, and general disorientation that an upset presents. Additionally, many pilots have never studied the lift vector management or managed rudder application or explored the aircraft's characteristics at the edges of the flight envelope. You'll see how important this is when it comes to recovering from an upset position. But how do we get in these positions in the first place? Glad you asked, Greg. We're going to talk about loss of control in this order. Stalls, turbulence, spatial disorientation, mechanical or structural failure, runway contamination, and pilot judgment. Now most of these topics overlap, particularly the judgment part. But let's get started with the stall. Want to lose control of your aircraft in a hurry? Make it stop flying. Stall spin accidents are responsible for nearly half of all maneuvering flight accidents. Most of these occur at low altitudes and over one quarter of them occur on takeoff. Stall spin accidents tend to be more deadly than other types of GA accidents, accounting for about 10% of all accidents, but 13.7% of fatal accidents. The higher likelihood of fatalities in stall spin accidents is due largely to crash dynamics. If an aircraft strikes the ground in a normal landing attitude and can dissipate the crash energy over even as little as 100 feet, the chances of fatality, assuming no fire, decrease significantly. However, if the impact occurs nose down at a high rate of descent, which is typical of a stall spin scenarios, the g-forces are much higher and we just can't survive the rapid deceleration. A stall is a loss of lift and increase in drag that occurs when an aircraft is flown at an angle of attack greater than the angle for maximum lift. Angle of attack is the angle at which the wing meets the relative wind. In level flight, the angle of relative wind is determined primarily by the aircraft's airspeed. If the speed is too slow, the angle of attack required for level flight will be so large that the air can no longer follow the upper curvature of the wing. The result of this separation of airflow from the wing, loss of lift, a large increase in drag, and eventually a stall if the angle of attack is not reduced. The stall is a result of excessive angle of attack, not airspeed. For many GA aircraft, 
that occurs between 16 and 18 degrees. But it can occur at any airspeed and at any attitude and at any power setting. Flaps, landing gear, and other configuring devices can affect an airplane's stall speed. Extension of flaps and or landing gear in flight will increase drag. Flap extension will generally increase the lifting ability of the wings, thus reducing the airplane's stall speed. Speed brakes or air brakes will decrease the amount of available lift, increasing the aircraft's stall speed. The speed at which critical angle of relative wind is exceeded is the stall speed. Stall speeds are listed in the Airplane Flight Manual, AFM, or the Pilot Operating Handbook, POH, and relate to certain aircraft configurations. Airspeed values specified in the AFM or POH may vary under different circumstances. Factors such as weight, center of gravity, altitude, temperature, turbulence, and the presence of snow, ice, or frost on the wings will affect an aircraft's stall speed. One indication of a stall is a mushy feeling in the flight controls and less control effect as the aircraft's speed is reduced. This reduction in control effectiveness is attributed in part to reduced airflow over the flight control surfaces. In fixed pitch propeller airplanes, a loss of RPM may be evident when approaching a stall in power on conditions. For both airplanes and gliders, a reduction in the sound of the air flowing along the fuselage is usually evident. Anytime you have a yoke or the stick near its aft limit, watch out for the stall. Just before the stall occurs, buffeting, uncontrollable pitching, or vibrations may begin. Many aircraft are equipped with an aural stall warning device. Finally, kinesthesia, the sensing of changes in direction or speed of motion, when properly learned and developed, will warn the pilot of a decrease in speed or the beginning of a mushing of the aircraft. We like to call this seat of the pants flying. These indications serve as a warning to the pilot to increase airspeed by some combination of adding power, lowering the nose, and retracting air brakes. The real important thing is the preventative medicine, not stalling in the first place. And if you do, keeping the airplane coordinated, because an airplane coordinated with the ball centered is not going to spin. So a good exercise for you and the instructor to work on is a slight power on stall Bring the nose up, and when you stall the airplane, keep the airplane stalled, and you probably notice it's pitching downward, and use your rudders and a little aileron help to keep the airplane under control. Again, the airplane's not going to spin if you keep the ball centered. So you raise the nose up high, keep it in its, in its stall for a little while. This is called a falling leaf. It's great coordinating practice to realize that the airplane can be controlled even during an inadvertent stall. When practicing stalls, you should be at an altitude that allows recovery, above 1,500 feet above the ground level for single engine airplanes and 3,000 feet above ground level for multis. Go rounds are responsible for a good number of stall spin accidents. A causal factor in such accidents has been the pilot's failure to maintain positive control due to a nose-high trim setting or premature flap retraction. Properly configuring the airplane for the go-around and quick but methodical actions in cleaning up the airplane make go-arounds a non-event. Your short final checklist at 300 feet should anticipate the go-around. The altitude required for recovery from stalls is minimal compared to that required for recovery from spins. Pilot operating handbooks for various typical GA aircraft estimate average altitude loss during stalls, assuming proper recovery technique, has been 100 to 350 feet. But as Greg mentioned earlier, recovery from a spin is a far different matter and takes much more altitude even with highly skilled pilots. In fact, there have been quite a bit of discussion regarding the value of spin training. It's currently not normally taught or required except for CFIs. The consensus is that learning to avoid a spin is the most effective spin training there is. Intentional stalls, like we learn to recognize in primary training, are one thing, but inadvertent stalls are the gotchas. Remember from earlier that the stall is actually a result of the relationship 
of the angle between the relative wind and the wing cord. It's airspeed control in most situations that gets us to the edge. Remember, as you slow, you need to pitch up to maintain altitude. A common and very deadly airspeed control situation shows up in the pattern. You're already low and slowing, and you throw a too steep turn to final because you overshot, while you're slowing down even more because you're too high. It was a bad judgment that got you there, but it's aerodynamics and piloting skills, or lack thereof, that will take you out. An accelerated stall happens when the aircraft is in an excessive bank with strong back stick forces to hold altitude. We all trained to recognize this phenomenon and it may come into play while aggressively turning about a point. Can you say buzzing? The air speeds can be high. For example, stall speed on Greg's decathlon clean is 53 knots, but at 45 degree bank, that goes up to 63 knots. At a 60 degree bank, it's 75 knots. Remember, a stall can occur at any airspeed, in any altitude, and at any power setting. Weight and balance issues have turned many beautiful airplanes into beer cans and mobile homes. Particularly dangerous in flight is an aft center of gravity, or CG, in most any airplane, but certain aircraft have less margin for error than others. If the CG is too close to the center of lift, the nose can't drop in a stall meaning there's generally no recovery. A too far forward CG in some planes can make touching down on the mains before the nose wheel difficult. We're not going to address the physics of how loading out of the envelope affects the aerodynamics, but we cannot emphasize enough that it's critically important to stay within your CG limits per your aircraft's flight manual. Since a high percentage of stall spin accidents happen in the landing phase of flight, one very effective accident prevention measure is to fly a good approach. If air speeds and your turn rates are properly managed during the approach, you've just eliminated most of the stall spin opportunities. But don't stop flying on short final. You might have just completed the finest, smoothest, safest flight of your career and then stall too soon on flare for landing. In some airplanes, under some conditions, good airmanship might salvage the situation or at least keep the damage to a minimum. But the real answer is to fly the airplane until the keys are safely in your pocket. Another stall inducer is airframe icing. Ice in flight is never good news. It destroys the smooth flow of air, increasing drag while decreasing the ability of the airfoil to create lift. The actual weight of the ice on the airplane is insignificant when compared to the airflow disruption it causes. As power is added to compensate for the additional drag and the nose is lifted to maintain altitude, the angle of attack is increased, allowing the underside of the wings and fuselage to accumulate additional ice. The airplane will stall at a much higher speed and lower angle of attack than normal. It can roll or pitch uncontrollably and recovery may be impossible. I think you can see that significant icing equals probable loss of control. Therefore, conditions where icing is a possibility are to be avoided, period. Even if your aircraft is certified for flight into known icing conditions. Partial de-icing equipment, such as heated propeller or windshield, does not prepare an aircraft for flight into known icing conditions. It only makes the escape a little more viable. If you're stuck with an aircraft that's iced up, increase your approach and landing speeds, anticipating a higher stall speed. Make your pattern wider and your turns gentler. Lowering the gear, applying flaps, or air brakes might have much different effect on the pitch than you're used to. A go around or a missed approach would be a bad choice. The Safer Skies Weather Program, as taught in the FAA's WINGS program, has an in-depth treatment of aviation weather in general, and icing in particular ordering information at, you guessed it, the end of this program. There's one other kind of stall to mention, and fortunately it's one that most of us will never have to deal with, the coffin corner. This affects jets flying fast at high altitudes. The coffin corner refers to the converging edges of their operating envelope. The speed margin between high and low speed buffet in the coffin corner may be just a few knots. 
and it can even disappear altogether. Pilots are well advised to choose a lower flight level if the coffin corners high and low speed buffet boundaries converge too closely. Otherwise, a small increase in bank angle or an encounter with turbulence may be all it takes to induce an actual stall. Let's move on to turbulence as a factor in control loss. All turbulence you'll encounter in an aircraft comes from one of two sources. Nature in the form of wind of some sort and man in the form of aircraft weight turbulence or vortices. Hazardous turbulence is present in all thunderstorms. In a severe thunderstorm, it can damage or destroy an airframe. The strongest turbulence within the cloud occurs with shear between updrafts and downdrafts. Outside the cloud, shear turbulence has been encountered several thousand feet above and as much as 20 miles laterally from the severe storm. It is almost impossible to hold a constant attitude or altitude in a thunderstorm. Maneuvering or attempting to do so greatly increases the stresses on the aircraft and may cause breakup. In most thunderstorm accidents, the storm first causes a loss of control that is followed by either an in-flight breakup or a collision with the ground. Either way, it's not good. The visible thunderstorm cloud is only a portion of the turbulent system whose updrafts and downdrafts often extend far beyond the visible storm cloud. Thunderstorms almost always generate microbursts and gust fronts with their accompanying wind shear. Microbursts are small-scale intense downdrafts which, on reaching the surface, spread outward from the center. This is causes the presence of both vertical and horizontal wind shear that can be extremely hazardous to all types and categories of aircraft, especially at low critical flight attitudes. As a microburst downdraft spreads down and outward from a cloud, it creates an increasing headwind over the wings of the oncoming aircraft. This headwind causes a sudden leap in airspeed and the airplane lifts. If the pilot is unaware that this speed increase is caused by wind shear, he or she is likely to react by reducing engine power. However, as the plane passes through the wind shear, the wind quickly becomes a downdraft and possibly a tailwind. This reduces the speed of air flow over the wings and the extra lift and speed vanish. Because the plane is now flying on reduced power, it is vulnerable to sudden loss of airspeed and altitude. The pilot may be able to escape the microburst by adding power and trying to maintain or increase airspeed. But if the wind shear is strong enough, a potentially disastrous loss of control may be difficult to avoid. One of the first things that glider pilots learn is that updrafts and downdrafts cohabitate the sky. If you're going to work the lift to your advantage, you've got to learn to avoid or at least manage the effects of sink. The point of all this is, thunderstorms are extremely dangerous, especially in small aircraft. Even the most skilled pilot is no match for a thunderstorm, any thunderstorm. This is a fundamental aspect of aeronautical decision making. If you do find yourself in a thunderstorm, reduce your airspeed to VA. Turn off the autopilot. Turn up your inside lights to full intensity. Tighten your seat belt and fly straight ahead. Fly the pitch attitude, not the altimeter. Do not attempt 180. Do not try to over control the airplane. Just try to gently keep it right side up and close to VA. When it spits you out, concentrate on a smooth recovery. Remember, upside down in an airplane is not necessarily a bad thing if you can remember your recovery technique. Next up, wake turbulence. You might have learned early on that the higher pressure air beneath an aircraft's wings slips around and over the wing tip to the relatively low pressure region atop the wing. Combined with the forward velocity of the aircraft, a tightly spiraling rotational flow of air called a wake vortex is created. It looks like a horizontal tornado. The strongest vortices are produced by heavy aircraft flying at low air speed at a high angle of attack. For example, a large or heavy aircraft that must reduce its speed to 250 knots below 10,000 feet and is flying in a clean configuration while descending produces very strong wake. 
Extra caution is needed when flying below and behind such aircraft. While there have been rare instances where weight turbulence caused structural damage, the greatest hazard is induced roll and yaw, an upset. This is especially dangerous during takeoff and landing when there is little altitude for recovery. During takeoff and landing, the vortices sink toward the ground and move laterally away from the runway at three to five knots when the wind is calm. At altitude, vortices sink at a rate of about 250 to 500 feet per minute and stabilize about 500 to 900 feet below flight level of generating aircraft. Close to the ground, however, a strong vortex can actually bounce back up about 200 feet. Helicopters also produce wake turbulence, also known as rotor downwash. Helicopter wakes may be of significantly greater strength than those from a fixed wing aircraft of the same weight. Use caution when flying in close proximity to rotorcraft. Rotor downwash wake turbulence in ground effect hover can reach as much as three times the rotor diameter and are subject to prevailing winds. Incident data shows that the greatest potential for a wake vortex incident occurs when a light aircraft is turning from base to final behind a heavy aircraft flying a straight-in approach. Use extreme caution to intercept final above or well behind the heavier aircraft. The pilot is responsible for wake turbulence separation. Pilots must not decrease the separation that existed when the visual approach was issued unless they can remain on or above the flight path of the preceding aircraft. On an instrument approach, the rules are firm. A light aircraft following a larger aircraft requires four miles of separation. For a small aircraft behind a heavy aircraft, it's six miles. Here are some tips for avoiding wake turbulence. During departure, if you think wake turbulence from the preceding aircraft may be a factor, wait at least two or three minutes before taking off. If you're uncomfortable, tell the tower that you want to wait. Plan the lift off before the rotation point of the preceding aircraft. If you can, climb above the preceding aircraft's flight path. If you can't outclimb it, deviate slightly upwind and climb parallel to the preceding aircraft's course. Avoid headings that cause you to cross behind and below the preceding aircraft. If you must cross behind the preceding aircraft, try to cross above its flight path or, terrain permitting, at least 1,000 feet below. When following, stay either on or above the preceding aircraft's flight path, upwind, or at least 1,000 feet below. If you can't stay that far above or below, maintain a four to six mile separation behind the larger aircraft. On approach, maintain a position on or above the preceding aircraft's flight path with adequate lateral separation. When landing behind a larger aircraft on the same runway, stay above the other aircraft's glide path, a dot or even two on the glide slope, and ensure that your touchdown point is beyond the preceding aircraft's touchdown point. Otherwise, you should stay between four and six miles behind the larger aircraft, depending on how much bigger he is than you. When you're landing behind a departing larger aircraft on the same runway, note the larger aircraft's rotation point and land well before it. Remember that crosswinds may affect the position of the vortices. When landing behind a larger aircraft on a parallel runway, consider the potential for its wake vortex to drift onto your runway. Adjust takeoff and landing points accordingly. Let's move on to spatial disorientation. We tend to think of spatial disorientation as something that happens to low-time VFR pilots who stray into IMC and spiral in. Yet spatial disorientation can overtake experienced high time pilots as well and can lead to complete loss of control if not remedied immediately. 91% of spatial disorientation accidents are fatal. Spatial disorientation is mistaken perception or illusion of one's position and motion relative to the earth. 90% of the information we use to orient ourselves comes from our eyes and that information overrides the other senses. The vestibular system in the inner ear provides the brain with all the information it needs to maintain balance on the ground. As the body moves, the motion of fluid in the ear canals provides the brain with roll, pitch, and yaw information. 
But the vestibular system has its limitations, such as when a turn commences in the air, the inertia of the fluid moves in the opposite direction relative to the sensory hairs, and we correctly interpret the turn and its direction. But if the turn continues, the fluid catches up, creating the sensation that the turn has ceased. Therefore, a prolonged constant rate turn results in the fault sensation of not turning at all. Additionally, any bank rate of less than two degrees per second is insufficient to stimulate the fluid in the canals and will not be felt. Considering that a standard rate turn is three degrees per second, you might understand how without visual reference, it's possible to enter a bank that becomes progressively steeper while feeling that the aircraft is flying straight and level. This can lead to an aptly named graveyard spiral. As the airplane spirals downward and its airspeed and descent accelerates, the pilot senses the descent but not the turn. The natural tendency is for the pilot to pull back on the yoke to arrest the altitude loss. But with the bank angle having gradually increased, this control input only tightens the turn and increases the descent rate. The number one cause of spatial disorientation accidents, and keep in mind, they're almost always fatal, is VFR flight into IMC. So the bottom line is that if you're not an instrument rated pilot, you must stay out of IMC. Of course, in many parts of the country, if you stayed out on the ground every time the marginal conditions prevailed, the possibility of thunderstorms were forecast, you wouldn't fly very often at all. The key is to have a plan B and the flexibility to use it. Many pilots who succumb to spatial disorientation have plenty of time to get themselves out of trouble, but they continue on as if the deteriorating conditions blind them to their options. Having a plan B and using it, if necessary, is an important aspect of good ADM. So the best way to avoid spatial disorientation and resulting loss of control in IMC is to be able to fly the aircraft by instruments. But as we said earlier, an instrument rating, while enormously valuable, does not guarantee you'll never fall victim. Illusions of the senses can be very powerful, and spatial disorientation can overcome even the most experienced pilot flying with functional instruments. Add to that the fact that instruments can fail. Over the last decade, there were 24 fatal IFR spatial disorientation accidents in which inspectors found evidence of vacuum system or other instrument failures. This shows a widespread inability of instrument rated pilots to fly by partial panel, even though this skill is required to achieve the rating. So the moral of the story is, first, get your instrument rating, and second, practice flying partial panel. We'll talk more about instrument failure in a moment. Okay, two more to go. Up next is mechanical failure. The number one cause of fatal accidents following a mechanical failure is loss of control, not the mechanical failure itself. A prepared pilot with a plan can handle most mechanical malfunctions, maintaining a high degree of safety. It's been said that rule number one when dealing with a mechanical failure is fly the airplane. Rule number two is fly the airplane. In an emergency situation, keeping the aircraft under control is priority number one. There is no good time for an engine to fail. The reaction time you have after the failure, the better. Pilots must mentally discipline themselves before takeoff that if the engine fails below a minimum safe turnaround altitude, turning back to the airport may lead to a stall spin and subsequent loss of control. What is the minimum safe turnaround altitude? A good rule of thumb is seven to eight hundred feet but it varies depending on the wind, the aircraft, and the configuration. Takeoff is the riskiest part of the flight with respect to engine failure. This is when the power plant is first put to the test and when we learn if everything is going to hold together. If there is a power problem on approach, it's usually carburetor ice or fuel mismanagement, pilot failure, not mechanical failure. An engine failure after takeoff is extremely frightening and can reduce mental sharpness to pudding with a snap 
of a connecting rod. Armed with a target altitude, you're ahead of the game. Once airborne, begin looking for a place to land. It might be difficult to shift mental gears so abruptly and think about a forced landing during the early moments of flight, but this simple procedure can pay handsome dividends. If a landing area has been selected, the shock of an engine failure at low altitude won't be quite so dramatic. Suitable landing sites aren't always ahead or behind. A better choice might be off to the side. Only after achieving appropriate altitude should they turn around to the airport be considered. Several techniques can help you reach that altitude. Initial climbs should be made as steeply as is practical and safe. This gets you high while still close to the airport. Many pilots habitually retard the throttle almost immediately after liftoff. Avoid this unless required by local noise abatement procedures. If the engine is operating normally at maximum power, leave it that way and use it to maintain maximum climb performance. Do not reduce the power until safely above the minimum turnaround altitude or until a relatively safe off-airport landing could be made. Knowing your airplane can make all the difference in the world. Pulling the prop back, for example, may be the difference between making the runway or the woods. Some aircraft, like certain Piper models, have an automatic gear extension system that drops the gear in certain low power, low airspeed situations. Exactly what you don't want to happen at 500 feet with a failed engine. A good practice in that case is to override the auto gear extension until at a safe altitude. VMC, minimum control speed, loss of control is particular to asymmetrical thrust twins, which is most of them, and most particular to non-counter-rotating twins, which is almost all of the older piston twins. Without spending a whole day on P-factor and torque, let's just say that when one of the engines quits on a twin, particularly if it's the left engine, on most non-counter-rotating airplanes, there is a significant adverse yaw effect that has to be corrected with the rudder and aileron. At some point, the airspeed across the control surfaces is too slow to allow the controls to counteract the yaw and or roll forces. At that point, you cease becoming a pilot and become a passenger on a decidingly unpleasant trip. You've just rotated and pop! You're now flying a single and it's pretty badly out of trim. Better have a plan because things happen really fast from here on out. If you drop the nose to maintain airspeed, and if you can identify and feather the dead engine, and if you can clean the airplane, and if you're not too heavily loaded, and if it's not too hot and high, and if you can maintain at blue line, and if you don't get distracted trying to restart or find that TV tower, you might fly out of the situation. And if you keep your wits about you and fly a good pattern at proper speeds and make the airport without being too high or too low, you might be able to talk about the day over a beer with your friends. Did you catch the most important part of that last dialogue? No, not the beer. Airspeed. That's airspeed in case you were sleeping. And even if in a twin, you can't maintain airspeed at or above VMC, minimum control speed, you've got no choice but to reduce power on the good engine and try to control your off airport arrival. On to vacuum and accompanying instrument gyro failures. As we discussed in the spatial disorientation section, this can be a very serious problem. Flying IFR with a single vacuum pump is a gamble. The dry pumps used on today's airplanes don't usually wear out. They more often just quit. Dry vacuum pumps are not particularly reliable and fail for various reasons. If engine cleaning solvent is sprayed in the vicinity of the coupling at the base of the pump, the coupling will almost certainly fail within the next five hours of operation due to deterioration. This preventable failure contains a valuable lesson. Launching into IMC immediately after under cowl maintenance is not a particularly safe practice. The first problem with a failed vacuum pump is realizing that the pump has failed at all. When there's a sudden loss of vacuum, the spinning rotors and the gyro instruments very gradually 
lose rotational speed before the instrument begins to precess. A pilot hand flying under instrument conditions may not realize for a few minutes that the vacuum pump has actually failed. When it dawns on the pilot that the indications from the directional gyro and artificial horizon instruments can no longer be trusted, the pilot without backup instruments installed in his airplane has to immediately switch to partial panel flying and recover from what may become an unusual attitude. The possibility of lost control during this transition is high. The best way to prevent this is to have a standby vacuum system or a standby electrical artificial horizon. Reliable backup vacuum and alternator systems are now available for almost any general aviation airplane and at least one manufacturer makes an electric artificial horizon with an internal battery backup. Having said that, let's look at what you should do if you lose your gyros in IMC. As we said before, your best choice is to fly partial panel until you can reach visual conditions or are safely on the ground. But just because we practice partial panel operations doesn't mean that the loss of gyros is something we should be able to handle in the normal course of a flight without having to make some significant changes in how we operate. Keep in mind that an actual partial panel situation is an extremely critical condition that has led to the deaths of many experienced pilots and their passengers. One problem you might run into in the event of an instrument failure is the challenge of ignoring your failed instrument. It can be very disorienting to look at a false artificial horizon. As soon as you can confirm the loss of one or more instruments, you should immediately cover them up. Many pilots keep post-it notes in their bags just for this very purpose, or you can buy a suction cup rubber covers, either from a pilot supply sources or even a grocery store. The next thing to do is to declare an emergency. It is important to realize that controllers do not necessarily understand the significance of, I lost a gyro, or I'm on partial panel. You will need the controller's help, and declaring an emergency is the best way to get it. Finally, here's a tip that might help. Put your hands in your lap. Small inputs on the rudder pedals while monitoring the turn and bank or turn coordinator will keep the wings level. Level wings eliminate the possibility of a graveyard spiral. This trick prevents abrupt and aggressive pitch changes, which are a primary cause of airframe structural failure and practically eliminates the possibility of a stall. This technique, combined with trimming for a gradual descent, is also a lifesaver for non-instrument rated pilots who find themselves trapped above a cloud layer. Let's talk about the landing phase, which is where over 30% of the loss of control accidents happen. First and most common is the crosswind. Every certified aircraft has a demonstrated crosswind component that's published in the flight manual. This doesn't mean that's all the crosswind it might handle or that anything at or under that component will be okay. Most of that has to do with pilot's ability and some of it has to do with the surface conditions. The crosswind component is the level of direct crosswind that the professional test pilot could or would handle for certification. If you feel your abilities are at the test pilot standards, okay. But most of us would err on the side of caution. Greg, would you be so kind as to take us through an approach to landing in a crosswind? You bet, Ben. But before I do, let me add something about runway conditions. There have been plenty of incidents of aircraft making it safely onto the runway and the losing control. That often has something to do with a crosswind but can also be the results of a wet, snowy, or icy surface. Occasionally, it will relate to a mechanical failure, like a failed thrust reverser on a jet, or maybe just slick tires on a wet runway. But these things add up. If the runway is slick or short, maybe an extra margin of error is called for in computing the safe crosswind component. And there's a big difference in ground handling in a tail dragger versus a tricycle gear aircraft. You know, the ones with the training wheels. Okay, we're at the traffic pattern for a crosswind landing. We're on downwind, and what we consider here is our drift at this point. Some crosswinds will blow us into the uh, runway, some will try to blow us away. We need to make that correction so we make a nice square pattern, give ourselves plenty of room for the turns. 
Well, you got to consider that the wind's been trying to blow you into the runway. Your base leg's going to be rather short and fast. That's going to also make you tend to be a little high. All right, I'm watching the end of the runway, and I'm maintaining my normal procedures and setting up the airplane for landing to my normal cockpit checklist. Crosswind landings are more difficult, so give yourself plenty of time. Don't try to make the hot, tight pattern on, on a day that's difficult for you. All right, we're turning the base leg now. And today we've got a headwind on base leg, so we know we're going to probably have to carry a little extra power. Okay, so once you turn base leg, check what you got, make sure that the, uh, once you turn base leg, check what you got, make sure you got the power you need for the approach. Now in our situation with the headwind on base leg, we're going to make the turn just a little later than normal. Okay, turn to final, still judging my glide path, want a good runway alignment. If it ain't got slowed, you need to make appropriate changes in the airspeed to adjust for it. We've got a center line on the runway now. So we're just going to find us a crab angle that drives the airplane down final, holding the center line. But as we get toward the runway, and early enough that we're, we're comfortable, let's move the fuselage straight with the rudders, correct with a little aileron into the wind to check any sideways drift. Finally, let's talk about altitude control and buzzing. In a sense, we've saved the worst for last because while the other causes of control loss involve some external factor, this one's all on the pilot's judgment. When you choose to fly low, you're taking unnecessary and unwise risks, period. Now I know it might be exciting, and yes, an airplane flies just as well at 20 feet as it does at 10,000 feet. But it doesn't take a genius to realize two problems with flying low. First, you can run into stuff like power lines and trees. Second, you have no room to recover should you experience a stall such as would be caused by a quick pull up to avoid one of those aforementioned power lines or trees. There's no room for good aeronautical decision making when you're flying close to the ground because you have very few options. The hazards of low flying can easily cause loss of control and give you no time to regain it. When a pilot attempts to buzz an object on the ground, he or she is descending nose down and then, hopefully, pulls out of the dive in time to recover. If the angle of attack is too steep during that pullout, the wing can stall violently. It won't be the garden variety stall with minor altitude loss that you experienced in training. At low altitude, Chalk one up for the Grim Reaper. Another reason that buzzing is a bad idea is target fixation. The pilot becomes so focused on the target that he or she waits too long to pull out of the maneuver and crashes into terrain. Finally, keep in mind that when you fly, you are the face of general aviation to the public. Flying low or buzzing can incite concern, anger, or panic, so just use good judgment. Let's move on to some upset recovery techniques. Take it away, Greg. Thanks, Ben. Avoiding loss of control is as simple as assessing the situation, making quick and reasonable decisions, and applying the proper control inputs at the right time. Perceive, process, perform. When you have enough altitude to work with, you should be able to recover from any upset and regain control of your aircraft with the proper training. Now we're going to take just a moment to demonstrate what could happen if you, did, if you recover from an upset in the wrong manner. This would be the natural reaction of somebody who does not understand a recovery to pull back on the stick trying to recover the airplane from any attitude. But as you know, an airplane's flip always comes perpendicular off the top of the wings. We roll this airplane upside down and the lip is going to point straight down. So this 1800 pound airplane is going to have 3600 pounds of downward force upside down, especially if you start pulling. And the airplane's going to make a curved descending path. We're going to do this from a slow speed, because if this is actually done in, in cruise speed, which could happen during an upset, an, an upset the airplane uh, 
to be stressed beyond its limits. All right, we're going to roll the airplane upside down like we just got hit by turbulence, and we're going to go, uh-oh, and the houses will get bigger. Do it that way. We're losing lots of altitude, picking up speed. First thing you've got to do when this airplane gets upset is you've got to stop that lift. A little bit of forward stick would lower the angle of attack. And even perfectly, the most perfect way to do it would get you to zero angle of attack. Then the airplane will still be going down, but it'll only be going down at its own weight. Why, at the same moment that you've done that, roll the airplane with all the aileron, and it's get the brown side to turn in the blue. In other words, just get the uh, shiny side up. And get the airplane level. All right, we've got our altitude again. So I'm gonna put the airplane in the same upset with a trained recovery method. All right, so the airplane gets rolled upside down, and here we are, uh-oh. I just relax the stick forward and add the aileron and bring it on around. Okay, we're gonna do a recovery, a proper recovery. The airplane gets rolled upside down. I go, uh-oh, add aileron, and roll the plane out. A little forward pressure keeps the plane from diving. The aileron rolls it right side up. We don't pick up much speed. The airplane's recovered from the upset. I hope this program has encouraged everybody to take some upset training. And do remember, it counts toward your wings program. Nice work, Greg. It's never fun being upside down on your car payment, but upside down in an aircraft is not necessarily a bad thing. As you can see from Greg's presentation, aerobatic and upset training is like a master's degree in aviation. Good thing to have on your resume and might someday very well save your life. As I wrap up my portion, I'd like to leave you with some food for thought. We're all familiar with the term control freaks which in aviation may not be a character flaw, rather the result of years of training. Not necessarily a bad trait to have in the front office. Staying on top of the aircraft and the surrounding conditions at all times, especially in an emergency, will mean that you are in control of the aircraft, not the aircraft in control of you. You know, when we take the time to analyze all of the factors involved in safely completing even a simple flight for a short distance, we begin to realize that the responsibilities that we carry as pilots in command are not to be taken for granted. The goal should be zero mistakes, zero errors. Realistically, that's not possible. But when the technical skills under your control are in hand and you've minimized the errors, the potential threats are greatly diminished. But at every stage of flight, there are continuing situations that require your recognition, perceive, your decisions, process, and your actions, perform. The three Ps, perceive, process, and perform, should be constant and automatic whenever you operate in any flight crew capacity, in the air or on the ground. Now, recognizing the steps you can take to avoid a situation that might cause loss of control, and knowing how to respond if you do have loss of control, are just two more steps in our constant quest for safer skies.